either work with your hormones and thrive, or you can fight against your hormones and explode into a writhing mass of inflammation, pain, and panic. Welcome back to the acne series, guys. Hormones and acne. Let's start by understanding why hormones affect acne in the first place. Most commonly, it's noted that androgen receptors, i.e. sex hormone receptors, in the skin trigger the production of more oil when they're stimulated. Then that oil makes the skin sticky, which increases the likelihood that your pores will be clogged and that the oil and dead skin will feed bacteria, which will create an infection and inflammation, and bingo, pimple! A great theory, and I'm sure that this process does affect acne breakouts quite a bit, but it is, for better or worse, not quite so simple, especially these days. Most doctors and dermatologists claim that what you eat doesn't affect acne, but that is factually not true. Like the steroid hormones found in milk, most notably insulin-like growth factor one, creates changes in your sebaceous glands, causing them to produce more oil and become more prone to clogging. So even if you wanna just stick to the simplistic theory of sebaceous gland hyperactivity, then there you go. What you eat matters. And just to be clear, I'm talking about organic, artificial hormone-free, grass-fed, well-loved dairy. The horrible effect dairy has on your skin is fully capable of standing on its own. So we don't even have to begin to discuss the shit show that is bovine growth hormone use. When we talk about hormones and cyclical acne breakouts, the usual suspects associated with that are estrogen and testosterone, which stimulate sebaceous glands in your skin, increasing oil output. What most people don't realize is that the level of sex hormone coursing through your blood is very sensitive to diet. What should be obvious, but seems to escape the cognitive firing of most healthcare practitioners, is that when we eat dead mammals and their lactations, we are ingesting mammalian hormones. This exogenous hormonal input affects how our own hormones function. Additionally, animal-based foods and many processed foods are high in fat. When we eat high levels of dietary fat, it increases the level of many circulating hormones, including, but not limited to, sex hormones. Additionally, diets high in animal products and dietary fat decrease the amount of sex hormone binding globulin, which does exactly what it sounds like. It binds sex hormones, so excess can be eliminated via the liver, bile duct, and intestines. But animal and processed foods don't stop there. They provide the ultimate trifecta of hormonal fuckage by being completely devoid of fiber. Fiber provides bulk for the intestines shortening digestive transit time. Fiber is also highly absorptive, which means it can absorb and hold on to sex hormones while they're awaiting elimination in the intestines. Fiber also feeds beneficial bacteria, which support the health of your intestinal lining. Because, you see, when bound sex hormones are hanging around in your intestinal tract, they can be unbound by pathogenic bacteria, and those freshly unbound hormones are reabsorbed into the bloodstream, where they're able to wreak more havoc until your poor, burdened liver has to bind them and filter them out again. So in addition to this mess, dietary fat also highly affects insulin sensitivity. When you eat fat, fat gets into your bloodstream and it sticks around for about 24 hours. In addition to the nightmare that this creates for arterial flexibility, liver and kidney function, and any attempt at performing lymph pumping cardio, it also inhibits the ability of insulin to bind to blood glucose and ferry it into the cells where it's needed. So when you eat a high fat diet, you end up with high blood sugar, which triggers your body to release excessive amounts of insulin. If you've watched my other videos or you know know anything about the hormone insulin, you know that insulin pretty much affects every other hormone in your body, and it's not only associated with type 2 diabetes, but also polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the current darling syndrome of gynecology. 
everyone and their dog has polycystic ovarian syndrome because everyone and their dog is eating a shitty, high fat, high protein, standard Western diet. And it blows me away that doctors actually tell these women to eat more fat and more protein to manage their insulin. How the fuck does that work, doc? What goes through their mind? Hey, women are having this problem with sex hormones that's really closely related to insulin dysregulation, which we know can be helped with the same treatments that are effective at curing type 2 diabetes. So let's tell them to solve their problems with dietary recommendations and drugs that have never cured type 2 diabetes. Sounds effective. If you want to achieve healthy insulin levels and increase insulin sensitivity, you have got to stop overloading your body with dietary fat. To the point that your body is forced to store fat inside your muscles. Intramyocellular lipids. It's a thing. And it's a problem. You know how you buy a steak from a feedlot cow and it's full of marbling? Yeah, that's what your muscles look like. It causes insulin resistance. It's bad news. The science is clear, and I expect the medical establishment and our outdated, brainwashed, bribed doctors will catch on any decade now. Until then, Dr. Neil Bernard's work and literature on diabetes treatment is phenomenal. If you have questions about diabetes and, by proxy, polycystic ovarian syndrome, read his work. Alternately and additionally, check out Dr. Greger's chapter on diabetes and how not to die. Now, I know that what I just said is enough to prove that what we eat affects our hormones and that affects chronic acne, but God help me, the hormonal carnage doesn't stop there. Animal-based foods that are rich in fat also increase the production of prostaglandins, which are fat-based compounds that have hormone-like effects in the body. So, prostaglandins can be either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Guess which ones animal foods create? You're absolutely right, inflammatory prostaglandins. How did you know? A big producer of these inflammatory prostaglandins is arachidonic acid, which is a polyunsaturated omega-6 fat which is found abundantly in muscle tissue, also known as meat. Whether or not this arachidonic acid causes inflammation is dependent on a few factors, and the most important of which is the prevalence of oxidation, which implies it's very important to consume plenty of antioxidants. Another cause of increased inflammatory prostaglandin production from arachidonic acid is chronic immune stimulation, as is achieved from partially digested proteins and bacterial toxins entering the bloodstream via compromised intestinal membranes, or what we'll remember is referred to as leaky gut. So not only does arachidonic acid increase inflammation and thus acne, it also contributes to painful menstrual cramps and increased pain from arthritic or inflammatory conditions. So if you're dealing with issues like hormonal acne, inflammation, painful periods, or arthritis, you would be wise to eliminate the main sources of arachidonic acid from your diet. First and foremost, that means animal foods and some plant foods that are high in excessive amounts of omega-6 fatty acids, like a lot of nuts and seeds. It's also wise to be mindful that the fat-rich foods you're eating are already oxidized and rancid. The fats in dead animals especially, which whether or not you are aware, those animals have been dead for at the very least several days to several months, are not reliably unoxidized. And since animal flesh has less antioxidant power than even the crappiest nutrient void plants, it's wise to just ditch the animal products and opt for all plants all the time. So if that's not enough to convince you to lay off the fatty, acidic meat, dairy, and eggs, please consider the following. Hormone disrupting chemicals. There are a lot of them, both in variety and environmental saturation. I wish I could say that we could choose to avoid these chemicals completely through mindful lifestyle adjustments, but unfortunately, as DDT-saturated polar bears will tell you, 
that's no longer an option. Our environment is too saturated. These chemicals are too pervasive. I mean, you go to the grocery store and they hand you your receipt and you actually absorb BPA through your skin. From the paper, we're exposed to plastics nonstop. Car exhaust, chemicals from our clothes and or laundry detergent seep into our bloodstream all day long. So instead of ending all exposure, we have to focus on reducing exposure and trying not to freak the fuck out when exposure is unavoidable. Because hormonally speaking, freaking the fuck out is like <laughs> way bad. So the concentration of a lot of these types of chemicals like phthalates, BPA, DDT, PCBs, and other chemicals found in pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc., increase exponentially as they move up the food chain. It's called bioaccumulation. It's why predatory fish have more mercury and PCBs in their flesh than herbivorous fish, and why polar bears and bald eagles accumulate more DDT residue from their food source. The top of the food chain is a bad place to be when you're talking about bioaccumulation. And since many of these chemicals are stored in the flesh and fat, eating a fleshy, fatty diet is a sincerely bad idea. We raise and purposely fatten our food animals by feeding them chemical-soaked GMO feed and the ground-up carcasses of other industrially raised chemically fed animals. We feed herbivorous animals the parts of other animals. You know, the most voracious aquatic predators on this earth are pigs because we feed them so much mercury saturated ocean bycatch. It's like someone thought, how can we design a system that most efficiently compounds bioaccumulation? And they came up with this. I am in awe of the carelessness and utter disregard for human health. I don't know why I'm surprised every time, but I am every time. And you might be sitting there about to utter the phrase that every yuppie asshole has been hanging on to like Rose clutched to that door after the Titanic went down. I can read your mind. Grass-fed beef. While it's true, bioaccumulation might be a little bit lower in grass-fed animals, you're still getting a megadose of mammalian hormones, fat, protein, cholesterol, and as our environment is completely saturated, don't think that those cows are somehow isolated from these chemicals. They're getting it, and they're storing it, and they're giving it to you. And animal foods are higher in chemicals than plant foods, and those chemicals are more easily absorbed because of the copious amounts of fat in animal products. Those are the facts, period. There's one more way we're exposed to massive bioaccumulation that I'd like to address, and that isn't within your control at all what your mother did to you. So studies have found that women use fetuses as something of a dumpster for toxicity. The first fetus is usually the one that gets it the worst, with smaller loads going to each subsequent fetus. I think that's a big reason why my acne never got as bad as my older sister's, and why we both had worse, more consistent, and more prolonged acne than our mother did. Considering that you and I, kids born in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s are some of the first generations to be born to parents who themselves were exposed to massive environmental toxicity for their entire lives, and then to be exposed to even denser toxicity during our own formative years, I'd say that we have a bit of an unacknowledged problem. So if you're having trouble getting your parents on board with this proposed dietary change, if they're saying things to you like, well, we've been eating this way for forever and we turned out fine, go ahead and let them know that we're not even in the same boat, endocrinologically, hormonally speaking. However, all is not lost. It's absolutely vital we make the changes that we can to control further exposure to these hormone disrupting and liver and kidney overloading compounds. By a long shot, the most effective, easiest, and cheapest change we can make, stop eating animal foods. Stuff your face with whole plant foods. For hormonal health, we have to eat low-fat diets. Think of it this way, we evolved eating strictly low-fat. As we evolved, even if we were including animal foods in our diet regularly, which is questionable, 
those animals were wild animals and they were very, very lean. They were low in fat. We're talking about in the single digits of body fat percentage. We were not drinking the milk of confined fattened animals. That milk was not going through plastic tubing. And realistically, we weren't drinking any milk beyond weaning age. We were not consuming refined oils. Processed, nutrient void, high fructose corn syrup, loaded junk food did not exist. Refined carbohydrates did not exist. Fatty foods like nuts and wild avocados were seasonal and much lower in fat than the cultivated varieties that we currently have unlimited year-round access to. And when we did have access to fattier foods, they weren't filled with hormonally disruptive chemicals. This is a new era for human health, and we are going to have to do better than those who came before us better than our grandparents and our parents if we want to live disease-free, let alone acne-free. Our bodies are designed for starches, fruits, greens, beans, herbs, and other high-fiber whole plant foods. Stick to those and your body can and will sort itself out if you give it some time. The other major player in hormonal health is sleep. If you're human, and especially if you're a teenage human, your body needs sleep. It needs so much sleep. Sleep is the great regulator. It's the great healer of your body. And there's no way around that. I think it's a travesty that we live in a world that has marginalized and demonized sleep. A world where high school and college students are essentially forced by scholastic requirements and socializing into sleep deprivation because it's draining us earlier and earlier. It's setting us up for physical and emotional breakdowns. It's seriously not cool. All right, guys, I'm actually tired and I think my voice is about to give out. And I know you came here because you have pimples and maybe I totally overloaded you in a way that was completely unnecessary. Maybe I could have just talked to your vanity, but I refuse to talk down to you. And I feel like you're better off for it because I want you to understand your body is intricately connected and the inputs you give it matter. Your chronic acne breakouts are symptoms of very deep yet very fixable pathologies. And what could be more empowering than understanding how to take care of and repair your own physical vessel. All right, my dears, thumbs up if your mind feels full and enriched. Until next time, make better choices for yourself and take really, really good care. I will see you very shortly for an epic culmination of dietary and lifestyle suggestions for getting rid of chronic acne. See you shortly. Did the potato, you want to say hi? Yeah. Oh, thank you.